It took merely half an hour after the invention of the internal combustion engine for its creators to realize that forcing air into it would result in a more powerful output. This inevitable discovery sparked a worldwide effort to build superchargers, these crank-driven apparatuses that compressed the air-fuel mixture and gave an engine more power than it could ever produce naturally. These superchargers had a dirty little secret though, parasitic loss. Let's say you have an engine that makes 100 horsepower naturally aspirated and a supercharger that could produce 50 horsepower on top of the engine. Well, in theory, it should produce 150 horsepower combined, but in the real world, it may only produce 130 horsepower since 20 horsepower was used in rotating the supercharger and overcoming frictional forces. This fundamental problem would soon be solved by a Swiss engineer named Alfred Buki. His 1905 patent for an exhaust-driven turbine connected to an axial compressor to force air into the cylinders was the first the world had seen, what we know today as a turbocharger. In the German warship, the Hansestadt Danzig, the turbochargers could raise the diesel engine's output from 3,400 horsepower to over 6,400 horsepower. And even during World War II, the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress used a turbocharger on each of its four engines to compress the oxygen-sparse high-altitude air into denser oxygen-rich air similar to sea level to counteract the power loss at high altitudes. The turbocharger was the quintessential problem solver for the internal combustion engine, but one last obstacle was still to be conquered, and it was the hearts and minds of hot rodders. To win the super stock championship. Since the late 60s, one mad scientist has been at the forefront of showing the world the power potential of turbocharging automotive engines. His expertise was forged in the hellish conditions of dry lake beds and salt flats at velocities over 280 miles per hour. What started as a tiny engine shop to fund his college expenses transformed into one of the most prolific diesel tuning companies on the planet. Gail Banks and Diesel Trucks is akin to Carroll Shelby and the Mustang, Alois Roof and the Porsche 911, Smokey Nagata and the Toyota Supra. You can't mention one without the other. In this sixth installment of Legends, we will unravel how a hot rodder building boat engines became the undisputed king of diesel tuning. Gil Banks grew up in a perfect storm for a hot rodder. Southern California, which was a financial powerhouse during the post-World War II economic boom, and its geographical landscape of dry lake beds like El Mirage and desert highways, was a recipe for birthing legendary hot rodders at an alarming rate. Gail got his start at 14 years old by tearing down the engine in his mother's 1931 Ford Model A and then fixing it by increasing the output from 40 horsepower to 105 horsepower thanks to a laundry list of speed parts. By 16, he sold his first racing engine, a dual over at Cam Studebaker IndyCar engine under his newly found company, CP Auto and Marine Racing Engines, and used the $1,100 to offset his college tuition. By the early 60s, with two engineering degrees in hand and a 53 Studebaker, Gale had his crosshair set on land speed records. His 53 Studebaker Starliner was powered by a 337 cubic inch small block Chevy engine and used an ingenious air intake that increased the air density feeding the engine the faster it went, and it was immediately banned after setting at 159 mile per hour record and would go on to add 30 miles per hour to that record at the Bonneville Salt Flats. Air density was quickly becoming a focus for him. Higher altitudes and hotter temperatures like Bonneville were less than ideal for making power since the density of oxygen was thinner than back at sea level. The answer to this, just like in the B-17 Flying Fortress, was boost, and a whole lot of it. The water became the proving grounds for reliable high horsepower engines. The immense shock loads and the endurance needed to survive living a life between peak torque and peak horsepower hours at a time was a tall order for any engine builder. Where the competition was using root-style superchargers like the 671, Banks experimented with turbochargers. In a jet boat named Hurry Round Hondo, 
Using an 1800 horsepower twin turbo big block Chevy engine running methanol, it won every race it was in, including the NJBA and the APBA Nationals, and broke many records in the process. The change to turbos from superchargers proved to be less punishing to the engine's internals like the main bearings and provided extended engine life and far fewer rebuilds between races. His name would become the topic of discussion not only in the racing scene, but corporate offices worldwide as his turbocharged engines regularly were featured on the front cover of magazines. An unlikely name emerged from those corporate offices, and it was Volvo, who wanted Banks to develop a turbocharged package for the Volvo 240 Coupe and Sedan. Banks produced 14 prototypes over two years, which culminated in the introduction of the 1981 Volvo 240 Turbo. The car, the turbo by Volvo. It'll blow the past right out of your mind. Affluent customers kept Banks engineering pretty busy, even through the energy crisis of the 70s, notably a twin turbocharged big block Chevy powered Corvette called the Sundowner, which was piloted to 240.7 miles per hour in the thin high altitude air of the Bonneville Salt Flats. This car would get the attention of executives at General Motors who read about the car in popular hot riding magazine and wanted Banks to break the record in a Pontiac Trans Am. And they would do exactly that by a 43 mile per hour margin the following year. We're using turbocharging here to achieve power numbers that a few years ago were considered impossible. Banks would take his turbocharging philosophy and apply it to the 6.2 diesel, unbeknownst to GMC, and six weekends of work later, it was force-fed by a turbocharger and made an additional 60 horsepower and 115 pound-feet of torque, totally transforming the anemic 6.2 to an adequate workhorse. Seeing how revolutionary this was for the 6.2 diesel, GM would partner with Banks to offer a dealer option turbocharger package and would beat the Cummins turbo diesel as the first turbo diesel to market by one year. And many acknowledge this to be the genesis of the light duty diesel tuning era that still is thriving today. Banks would really solidify themselves in the diesel market once they began development on the 5.9 liter Cummins diesel. It was, from the factory, extremely robust, had a bulletproof mechanical injection system, an undersquare borne stroke which gave it great torque production. It was plagued by a poor induction design that unequally distributed air into the cylinders, having cylinder one and six running richer and hotter than the others since air likes to take the path of least resistance. Banks would develop a dual inlet twin ram which better distributed the air across the cylinders and combined with a fuel plate and turbine housing upgrade, the 5.9 with the Banks power pack made an additional 94 horsepower and 214 pound-feet of torque over the stock output while while maintaining 50 state emissions legality. Well, as you can see, the numbers don't lie. We picked up about 108 horsepower and almost 240 foot pounds of torque by bolting on the bank's power pack system. The potential of the 5.9 Cummins would be displayed in Gale Bank's stomping grounds, the Bonneville Salt Flats, with a $1 million R&D budget, a Dodge Dakota, and a Cummins turbo diesel. The 5.9 power plant maintained the stock pistons, crankshaft, and connecting rods with polished cylinder heads and more aggressive camshaft grind, a whole set variable geometry HY55 turbocharger, an air to water intercooling, and produced 735 horsepower and 1,300 pound feet of torque. <laughs> I wanted to do something to show the general public that diesels could be sporty. They could be fun, fast, powerful, quiet, clean, uh, and efficient. It will go on to set a world record, dethroning Ford and Roush as the fastest pickup truck at 217.314 miles per hour, and even hitting 222.139 miles per hour in qualifying. Banks would compete in almost every arena with diesel-powered trucks, from drag racing, the Baja 1000, even time attack at Pikes Peak. <laughs> 
During this time, the diesel tuning aftermarket was left largely unchecked. While laws did prohibit tampering with emissions control devices on vehicles, many aftermarket parts suppliers would use the code word off-road use only on products to shift any liability of misuse onto the end user. This worked until the trend of rolling coal became popular. Unlike gasoline engines, diesel engines can operate in a broad range of air fuel ratios, as rich as 15 to one or as lean as 60 to one. But below 25 to one, the engine will produce excess soot or leftover carbon from incomplete combustion. While it may look cool to some, it is essentially unburnt fuel that is wasted to the atmosphere and can produce dangerously high EGTs and decrease fuel efficiency. What was once a byproduct of poor tuning and overfueling the engine became a trend to dump clouds of smoke on purpose, usually on an unsuspecting Prius, and go viral on YouTube. If you don't have the air and you add the fuel, you blot out the sun and the EGT gets way out of hand. So you gotta have the air if you're gonna make the power. Banks, on the other hand, exclusively kept emissions equipment intact and stayed true to a tuning philosophy that clouds of soot was no good, and he was essentially exiled for it within the diesel tuning community. Being based in California, he made sure all of his products offered for street-driven trucks had a California Air Resources Board executive order, meaning even though they weren't OEM parts, they still complied with emission standards in all 50 states. This forward-looking approach gave Banks Engineering a sort of immunity when the EPA subsequently cracked down on emissions defeat devices and diesel tuning. This approach wasn't without criticism in the diesel community. It essentially created three groups of diesel owners, those who would follow Banks' philosophy and keep the emissions equipment and 50-state legality, those who would do the exact opposite and delete the emissions equipment for the highest potential power output and simpler maintenance, and then those in the middle who would keep the emissions equipment until it failed or posed a reliability concern and then would delete it as the cost to replace equipment wasn't financially viable as the trucks age and depreciated. Since mid-2007, all light-duty diesel pickups sold required a DPF, or diesel particulate filter, to filter particulate matter like soot from exiting out the tailpipe. Over time, this filter will essentially clog and the particulate matter needs to be burned off with a regen cycle, which consumes a lot of fuel. And in cases like the 6.4 power stroke, the regen strategy injects fuel on the exhaust stroke, washing out the cylinders, contaminating the oil and slowly destroying the engine over time. While Banks has shown you can make great power with the DPF and SCR systems intact, many owners to this day still opt to delete the systems altogether. Banks has always been a futurist, adopting turbocharging as the way to increase air density in a racing engine way back in the 60s when a roots blower was all the rage. Even at 80 years old, he still educates the next wave of aspiring tuners and builders and regularly uploads to his YouTube channel, which I will say is an absolute treasure trove and wealth of knowledge. While names like Carol Shelby and Vic Edelbrock are more recognizable in the American hot rodding space, Gail Banks deserves a seat at the table amongst the greats, being just as influential in shaping a generation, not as much with gasoline, but with diesel.